its economic strength and on its uh, technology. And so here's a country thinking that they can take on anything. When the, uh, when the crash hit in 2008, it has hit Japan with a vengeance. That the, uh, the, the national debt in Japan is actually higher than the national debt of the U.S. And that's hard to believe, isn't it? Uh, proportionally. And then when the tsunami hit, many of those coastal cities had actually tsunami walls that were 20 feet high, thinking that they could hold back the power of a tsunami. And that tsunami came in and just went over those walls like they weren't even there. You see, we have so many ways that we think we are in control. We think we are the ones that are determining our destiny. And all it takes is a tsunami of life to come. And we realize we are not in control at all. And so I think we need to have the ability to grow firm and strong as disciples of Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus, in a way that when the tsunamis of life come and the earthquakes shake us, we don't crumble and fall. Now, I did some research and saw that what was the reason that these buildings in Japan didn't crumble during this great earthquake? Now, what, what they have is, uh, first and foremost, is a good foundation on these buildings. Now, these high sky rises, they have a very elaborate system of their foundations actually being on these giant hydraulic uh, shock absorbers. And so the point is, is when a, an earthquake hits, because they know they are on this, uh, this uh, fault line that is the most volatile fault line in the whole world. So they know it's not, is, is an earthquake going to happen? It's, it's when an earthquake is going to happen. So they built their buildings prepared for this. And so these buildings are made to actually absorb the shock of the movement of the earth with their, the way they built their foundations. So they're built to move. The other thing that they do is that their stress points where, uh, where things are connected, they have these giant rubber buffers that allow the building to kind of shift and move. And so this article that I read is actually the, the, the perspective that they have of these buildings in Japan is that they're supposed to sway like a tree swaying in the wind and not break. And so there's a, there's a point of being resilient, of able to bend but not break. And that's exactly what these buildings did, that people were, that were downtown uh, Tokyo where these high sky rise buildings, they said you could literally look up and you can see the buildings moving a number of feet. And uh, I saw some videos of people that were in office buildings up high, and they said it was the most horrifying feeling to feel that building moving so far and being totally out of control. Now, I think we need to be resilient people, and we need to have a firm foundation in Christ through having good theology. It's imperative that we have to know what we believe and why. Now, on the other hand, the buildings in Haiti were built with a very rigid kind of construction of cinder block or cement that are mortared together with a very thin foundation. And so as soon as that 7.0 earthquake hit Haiti, those buildings, as it began, the ground began to shake, literally crumbled instantly because they were so rigid they, they weren't able to sway and move and shift with the ground that was shaking. When we don't have good theology, we're not able to sway and shift and move with the coming currents or the coming shifts in the ground around us as those quakes of life hit us because we all know that that's life, isn't it? Life at best is difficult as... Uh, as Peck talked about in The Road Less Traveled, that we have to have the ability to be able to have our, our foundation firmly rooted 
and the ability to shift and move, listening to the whispers of the Spirit of God as he leads us and directs us in our life. But when we are rigid and stuck in what we think is best and what we want to do, believe me, the ground will crumble. Now that is why, starting in April, we're going to go through a series of the book of Romans. Because I really believe that the book of Romans is the best theological treatise in one book that teaches us what a Christian is and how to live our Christian life. And so I'm sure you guys will be blessed and appreciate as we go through the book of Romans starting in April. So our vision of encountering God, first and foremost, is this, how we, this is how we begin to set our foundations down deeper and stronger. As we encounter God on a regular and consistent basis, our foundation grows down deeper. I was looking at the prayer of Jesus in John 17. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he gets arrested and eventually gets crucified, buried, and resurrected. In John 17, 1, as he's praying, he says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may be glorified. The Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So to encounter God, God wants us to have himself glorified in us and he wants us to grow to know him. We, one of the best ways for us to uh, grow and develop spiritually is by being regular attendees in church. Now, I'm not just saying this because I'm the pastor. and It's not about me. Okay, I don't want you to come to make me feel better about myself. This is something that God gives us to feed us so that we can continue to be nourished and grow spiritually. Now, I think discipline in the U.S. is one of the lost character traits and uh, we just don't grow. We just don't become healthy unless we're disciplined. We gotta have spiritual disciplines. Ken Davis spoke here Friday night, and uh, what a great speaker that guy was. He had us howling, laughing. But he talked about two years ago, he weighed 47 pounds more than he does today. And he said he saw a picture of himself at the beach with his grandchild, and he couldn't believe what the picture showed him. And he realized that his life was totally out of control and that he had no discipline in his life. And so he decided to enter into a triathlon. And entering into that triathlon meaning, meant he had to train for it. And so he started to exercise and he started to run and ride his bike and swim and he lost 47 pounds and finished the triathlon. But he talked about this issue of discipline. To grow spiritually, we have to be disciplined. One of the first steps of discipline is reading our Bibles daily. And he says the hardest step to make is just getting your Bible and opening it. But once we open our Bible, we read it. Even if it's 15 minutes a day, at least you are starting that discipline of reading the scriptures. And what happens is God begins to feed you and he begins to teach you and he begins to get your foundation down deeper it doesn't happen unless we're disciplined to do that so you guys have to find a time of your day that you encounter God personally and you read the scriptures and you take time to talk to God that's something novel called prayer we all need it on a daily basis the other thing that we need is we need to honor the Sabbath. I just think this is another thing that has been lost, especially in our culture here on the Western Slope, and I'm going to talk about that. Exodus 20, verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it what? Holy. Holy. That means it must be important. It says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day 
to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. See, there are aliens out there. It's in the Bible. So if you're abducted, you still have to honor the Sabbath. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now, I don't think God needed the Sabbath. He's self-sufficient. He's perfect. But why did God observe the Sabbath? To model to us what we should do. Part of the Sabbath is taking a day of rest and taking that time to worship God. That we need that time that we come together to corporately worship God and to be fed spiritually by the encouragement and teaching of the Word of God. Now, if we have a lifestyle that church is something we do when it's convenient instead of the church becoming the central focus of our spiritual health so that we can be encouraged and grow by being a regular, faithful attendee of church, we will never experience the blessings that God wants us to have to grow spiritually and have our foundations established down deeply so that when the tsunamis and the earthquakes of life hit us, we can withstand it. And some people think, well, that's just an Old Testament law. The law was uh, fulfilled in Christ, and we're living in the new covenant. Well, if that was true, why would the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament write this in Hebrews 10, 25? Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, as you see the day approaching, the Japanese knew that that day was approaching. They just didn't know when, and so they were prepared. Do we really believe that the day of Christ is approaching? Are we truly prepared for what waves and what shakes hit our life? Because they're going to come. The way that we are prepared is by establishing a good habit of daily time to read the Word and weekly making it a priority that we are in church so that we can be fed spiritually. Those guys in Japan that showed up after they just experienced that traumatic earthquake, that to me spoke to me of these guys' commitment. I think we can learn something about that. I, I think uh, I can see in my own life that I tried spiritual life without being a regular attendee of church. I, I thought, truly, I thought church was one of the lamest things I've ever seen when I was a young believer. And it wasn't until I started going to the vineyard when it was over on North Avenue in 91 that all of a sudden I realized, wow, I didn't know church could be like this. And I started to realize that as we went and we started to become regular at, coming, at going instead of just going whenever we had time for it, I started to realize that I was growing spiritually in a way that I've never grown before. And it grew to the point that I longed for it. And when Jane and I moved away in 95 to Canyon City, and there wasn't a church like this in Canyon City, we literally were starving spiritually. And so that's after two years of praying for God to bring a church like this in Canyon City where the Lord spoke to us, well, you do it. And we planted our church there, the vineyard there. You see, it's, it's not pharisaical. It's really for our benefit. The Sabbath is for you. The Sabbath is to bless you. The Sabbath is to encourage you. Now, now one of the things that, I have, that happens here in the Western Slope is I am quite aware that we live, we live in truly one of the most desirable places on the planet, don't we? And... Uh, we are in a recreational heaven. And so many people included in this church look at the summer as not a time to come to church and continue to be fed, but 
it's a time to take a three-month Sabbath from church. And so every weekend, we're at our cabins, we're at Lake Powell, we're, we're camping, and we're fishing, because that's the opportunity that you have. That's why you live here. And I, I just want you to know that that takes a toll on us spiritually. It really does. And because that's the way I was. My whole life was focused on my own pleasure of camping and fishing because that's the stuff that I love to do. Ask my wife. She knows that. And going away on the weekends. And when we just so happened to be home on the weekend, then I would go to church. And I, I want you to know that we need a steady diet of good spiritual food. And, you know, the reality is if, if you live on potato chips and Twinkies and maybe once a month go get a good meal, you are not going to be healthy. And uh, that, that guy who lived on McDonald's for 30 days, he found that out, right? So we need a good, steady, healthy diet of spiritual nourishment through being worshiping together corporately and being together to be fed and challenged by the Word of God so that we can continue to grow. And so I just challenge you guys to reconsider how you spend your summers and see if you made church more a priority, if it would be to your benefit and you would see spiritual growth. Now, we second thing is uh, encountering others. John 17, 20 says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I in you. There is power in becoming one. But we can't become one unless we are regularly meeting together in in groups. And you've heard us talk about groups. And groups is a major focus of our ministry here. Encountering God through coming to main service, encountering God independently as we worship God and, and are in the scriptures and praying to him. But there is the second thing of encountering others. As we encounter others in groups, what happens is, is we grow in love for one another. Yesterday, I was standing out in the lobby before the service, and, and this, a friend of ours, Sharon, c- came up to me and she said, Glenn just had a heart attack today. And I went, what? That's what I said. And she said, um, yeah, he was at the shooting range and he he had a heart attack. And uh, he had two stints put in yesterday. And I'm going, well, what? who came to see him? And she said, oh, our Bible study. All day we're hanging out at the hospital supporting us. You see, that is the church. Is they found that great support through that love that was given to Glenn, and I went to see him after the service last night, and he's, he was very chipper, and even though he had a heart attack, but he said, this is a wake-up call. I've got to change my lifestyle. I was so blessed to hear how they had chosen to be in a small group and how that small group was the first call when Glenn was in great need and they came to his aid. In a church this size, you guys, realistically, 